I'm Faith from Forbes Library. Oh, my name's right under my face. Sorry. Um, <laughs> but um, our our project scholar Kathleen Nutter is going to give a brief introduction. But first, I'm going to just ask you all to make sure that you're muted for now. Um, the video can be on or off. It probably uses less bandwidth if it's off, but we can see your smiling face if it's on. So it's up to you. Um, we're going to put information in the chat from time to time. Um, things like there are resources to share. We can put them there. You can put anything in the chat that you want. Um, if you have questions for any of the speakers or or points that you'd like to discuss after the speakers, you can put them in the chat and we'll address everything all at once at the end. Mm -hmm. So our project scholar, Kathleen Banks Nutter, was until 2019, the accessioning archivist for special collections at Smith College. Since earning her MA and PhD in women's labor history at the University of Massachusetts Amherst, Dr. Nutter has also taught at Smith and other area colleges and held an appointment as lecturer in the history department at Stony Brook University from 2004 to 2011. She is the author of The Necessity of Organization, Mary Kenny O'Sullivan and Trade Unionism for Women, 1892 to 1912, um, which was published in 2000 by Garland, and several articles, including most recently, You Know Where I Stand, Louise Day Hicks and the Politics of Race, Class, and Gender in Suffrage at 100, Women in American Politics since 1920, co-edited by Stacey Taranto and Leandra Zarno, and published this year by Johns Hopkins University Press. Kathleen. All right, well, thank you for that introduction, Faith. Um, I'm just going to give a real fast overview because we have three great panelists who have a lot to say about um, very um, current events. As the United States of America took shape in the late 1700s, those eligible to vote in most states were white, Protestant, property-owning males over the age of 21. The requirements for voting were not specified in the Constitution, but instead left up to the individual states. In the early decades of the 19th century, with the impact of the Industrial Revolution, the property requirement was lifted in many states, not all, replaced by a poll tax as needed, still though for white males over the age of 21. That poll tax uh, requirement uh, stayed well into the 20th century until the 1964 passage of the 24th Amendment, which prohibited the use of poll taxes for voting eligibility in only federal elections. And yes, passed in 1870, the 15th Amendment states that, quote, the right of citizens of the United States to vote shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or by any state on account of race, color, or previous condition of servitude, end quote. But with the end of Reconstruction in 1877, by the 1890s, the so-called Mississippi Plan, named thus for the first state which enacted multiple voting requirements, including impossible to pass literacy tests, poll taxes, etc., and that plan rolled across the entire South, effectively disenfranchising most African American men until um, the late 1960s. And as many of us know, especially this year, as for American women, regardless of race, they would not have full voting rights until passage of the 19th Amendment in 1920. Beginning in the early, uh, I'm sorry, the late 1950s and early 1960s, the civil rights movement intensified the challenge of segregation and voter suppression, meeting an often violent response. The march from Selma to Montgomery, Alabama, that began with Bloody Sunday on March 7th, 1965, was only one such occasion. But the nation was horrified by the violence they saw on the televisions in their living rooms every night. And finally, five months later, the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was signed into law, including provisions that required states with a history of suppressing voter voting rights based on race to submit changes to their election laws to the U.S. Department of Justice for what was called pre-clearance or basically approval. <clears throat> 
1971, the 26th Amendment lowered the voting age to 18, the age at which American men were subjected to the military draft. While the slogan, old enough to fight, old enough to vote, entered the political lexicon in 1942, just after the U.S. entered World War II, it took several years of the increasingly unpopular Vietnam War to affect such change. The Voting Rights Act was expanded in 1975 to protect lang language minorities, jurisdictions with a significant number of voters with limited English proficiency were to, were to provide voter materials in the appropriate other languages. In 1982, eight years before the Americans with Disabilities Act became law, Congress required states to make voting more accessible for the elderly and disabled as it extended the Voting Rights Act itself another 25 years. In 1993, the so-called motor voter practice, you, you apply for your driver's license, you can register to vote at the same time if you're over 18, that became law in 1993. Partially in response to the problems highlighted by the 2000 presidential election, uh, anyone of a certain age will remember the term hanging chads, Congress passed the Help America Vote Act in 2002. The goal was to streamline the process of voting as much as possible. But then the Supreme Court 5-4 to four decision in Shelby County versus Holder in June of 2013 undid much of the previous decades of voting reforms, ruling that states with a history of voter suppress suppression no longer had to submit any changes to their election laws to the Department of Justice for review, that process known as preclearance. In her now famous dissent in this case, Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg argued that, quote, throwing out preclearance when it has worked and is continuing to work to stop discriminatory changes is like throwing out your umbrella in a rainstorm because you're not getting wet, end quote and may she rest in power. By 2018, the nonpartisan coalition election protection found that a total of 23 out of 50 states had created obstacles to voting in the preceding decade. Now, welcome to election year 1920. I mean, <laughs> yeah, right, I wish uh, in some ways. Uh, election year 2020. Um, and now um, we will turn to our panelists to help us wend our way through this particular election year. First, I want to introduce Lindsay Sabadosa. She was the first woman, woman to ever hold the first Hampshire district seat. She earned her AB from Wellesley College, class of 2002, and her MSc from the University of Edinburgh, class of 2006. A community organizer at heart, Sabadosa organized her first protest march at the age of nine. I love that. She was protesting the closing of her home, hometown library due to budget cuts. She quickly became involved in political campaigns, starting in high school, volunteering on campaigns for former Congressman John Oliver, former Senator John Kerry, and several local officials. She soon began to focus her electoral work on women candidates, working for both local and statewide women candidates, and ultimately joining the board of directors of Emerge Massachusetts in order to deepen and expand her interest in building bridges. In 2018, she ran for office for the first time and was elected state representative for the first Hampshire, which is comprised of Northampton, Southampton, West Hampton, Hatfield, and Montgomery. She currently sits on the Election Laws Committee and has worked over her first term to help protect and expand voting rights. She filed legislation early during the COVID pandemic to allow for mail-in voting with Representative Mark, my former representative when I still lived in Bernardston, Mass. Their bill ultimately being in included in an omnibus piece of legislation that set the stage for the September and November 2020 elections. Today, Representative Savadosa will be sharing with us what Massachusetts is doing to ensure access to voting during COVID-19. Any challenges she confronts as a legislature, le legislator um, and how the process of ensuring access to the vote works at the Statehouse. Welcome, Lindsay. Thank you, 
Thank you very much. I'm going to try to share my screen now. So bear with me for one second. There we go. All right, does that seem to have worked for everyone? Yes. Yes, okay, great. I was hoping for a head nod somewhere. I was um, gonna say yes, but Oops, let's go backwards. But there we go. All right. Um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me here this evening. I'm delighted to talk a little bit about what elections look like in Massachusetts in 2020 and um, in particular how we can continue to help protect voting rights moving forward. Um, I think as Kathleen indicated at the beginning, um, we, we often spend a lot, we spend a lot of time talking about what voting looks like in, in the United States. And for me as a state legislator, it is very important to make sure that we don't lose focus on what's happening in our own backyard. Um, and so I sit on the election laws committee, which means that I get to um, talk about what this year's election looked like, which was really a truly fascinating process. Um, so we're just going to start off really simply talking about who can vote in Massachusetts, because I think that brings us quickly into who can't vote. Um, so you have to be a citizen of the United States and a resident of Massachusetts. That part is important, the resident of Massachusetts, because it can lead to a lot of confusion when we're talking about people moving interstate. Um, you have to be at least 16 to register to vote, but you have to be 18 years old on election day to vote. You cannot have been convicted of any crimes related to voter fraud or corrupt practices in respect to elections. Um, you may not be under guardianship um, in terms of voting on election day, and you cannot be incarcerated for a felony. Note that I did not say the word misdemeanor. Um, so what does that mean in reality? Um, you know, I just said you have to be 18 on election day. So that means sometimes people in the state can vote in the general election, but they can't vote in the primary. That's unique to Massachusetts. Um, there are uh, over 25 states, I believe, that have changed that law because they understand that oftentimes the election is decided in the primary, right? A lot of times we have in Massachusetts in particular, two Democrats running against each other in the primary. And by the time the general runs around, you're, you really have no other options on that ballot. So this is a way that some people, even though they can vote in the general election, especially young people, um, are unable to vote in the primary. There's we also have gone ahead and we have passed automatic voter registration in Massachusetts, which is a huge and wonderful thing, um, but it does lead to some confusion. So we said you have to be a resident in Massachusetts. Well, you don't get, you're not automatically registered to vote unless you have a license in Massachusetts. Sometimes people don't update their licenses right away. And so residency in the state is not enough to just go in on election day and vote. And that can be very confusing for people who think Massachusetts automatic voter registration, I just show up and I vote. That is not the case. So what are some barriers to voting normally? I mean, we've kind of talked about two. First, age, so when your birthday occurs. Voter registration deadlines, because they're often moving targets, they are not, it's not the same date every single year. Confusion about what automatic voter registration really and truly means. And then limited access to early voting. So a, we all know that life is challenging. We have a lot of obligations that we have to fulfill. Childcare and work are two of the biggest impediments to making sure that people can get to the polls on election day. And then restrictions on absentee voting. Massachusetts only allows absentee voting if you are out of town on election day, sick or incapacitated, or you have a physical disability. So going to work, that does not actually qualify you to be able to vote absentee. Not having childcare in order to get to the polls doesn't qualify you to vote for absentee. Now, some town clerks are very lenient in this, but others are not. And so that creates huge barriers if you happen to live in a place where your clerk is very, follows the rules very closely, as opposed to having a clerk who's a little bit more, um, a little more lenient. And then inaccurate voter rolls. So 
I could spend a long time talking about inaccurate loader rules, but there are very specific guidelines laid out that sort of say if you are registered to vote in the same town, but you move within the same town, you have to go back to your original polling place, which you may know you, is, is, is another impediment, particularly if you have a limited ability or lim limited ability to travel or a limited amount of time in which to vote and you didn't realize that your voter registration was not properly updated. Um, if you move from town to town within Massachusetts, sometimes you're able to cast a provisional ballot, but that ballot is only counted if then they're able to verify your voter registration. And sometimes you will go to the poll and they will tell you you just have to go back to where you were registered originally. Now, who does this cause a problem for? Oftentimes this causes a problem for people who are renting and they're switching, they, they move. So September 1st, which was our primary day this year, is often a time when people move. It's a huge problem for college students who, particularly in a year like this year, don't know when they're going to be back to college campus, if they're going to be back to college campus, where they should make sure that they're registered to vote. So there are solutions to these problems, but let's talk a little bit more first about how this affected the 2020 election. So as we are talking about 2020, we know that there are already barriers to voting, and then all of a sudden we have COVID to contend with as well. So we knew right off the bat we were going to need to have safer in-person voting and unfortunately COVID has become highly politicized. So there are towns in Massachusetts, in Massachusetts, that do not believe that COVID is a real thing. They think that COVID is the same as the flu and they do not think they need any extra protections. So when you're trying to create laws about voting, it is next to impossible to put out something that every city and town is going to agree with or be able to comply with. So I voted in person on election day in Northampton. There were different pens. It was very, um, it was very clear to me that I took a clean pen to vote with and I put it in the dirty pen bucket and it got disinfected. But those were all things that had to be specified ahead of time. And we spent a lot of time trying to figure out what was enough to make sure that everybody was safe, but not too much so that it was a burden on towns that they were unable to actually implement it. And within the scope of things that a town was going to accept, um, because again, there were definitely towns that did not want to add any protections for in-person voting. It was also really important to expand early voting. And I put both expand early voting and then required more funds because those things are both very true. Early voting is wonderful. It allows more people to participate, but it is also expensive, particularly if you think about some very small communities where you have one town clerk who's already a very part-time clerk. When you're adding extra voting days, even though those are based on the population of the town, you have to be very cognizant of what a town is able to do. We also talked about shortened blackout periods for voter registration. So right now, or normally, you can register to vote up until 20 days before the election. For COVID, we spend a lot of time talking about how can we get that shorter. Now, I am a huge proponent of election day registration. Um, and so for me, we should have just brought that down to nothing and let people register right up until and including on the day of election. Now, the reason for that is because a lot of times we're not even talking about people who are registering. We're talking about people who are correcting addresses, because when you correct your address, you basically fill out that registration again. So shortening the blackout period was a compromise in the end. It brought it down to that 10 days. Um, and it was really just a way to try to get as many people to participate as possible in a year when we knew there was gonna be more confusion and a lot more upheaval. The biggest thing that we did though, to make sure that voting was safer during COVID-19 was mail-in voting. And that meant including COVID as a physical disability to allow for mail-in absentee voting. Massachusetts, according to our constitution, does not just allow mail-in voting. Like I said at the beginning, we only have three ways that allow for absentee voting. And so we define mail-in voting as mail-in absentee voting, establishing COVID as a reason to allow for that. And that is what has allowed for this whole system that I hope all of you watching have participated in. Um, but it's important to remember that was 
only for COVID. Um, requiring more funding, I think you know, we can understand that both for that expanded early voting and also for the safer in-person voting, all those barriers that you saw, all of the different precautions that were taken. So you're coming in one way, opening up entrances that were not normally open for people to vote, though that all required a lot more funding. Um, and one thing that I didn't write, but that was also included is we got right up the second checkout booth for voting this year. So you go in and you, get your ballot, you check in, you give your, your name, your address, um, get your ballot. And then when you're done, you put it in the machine yourself, but you don't have that second check in the book. That helped by reducing the number of poll workers and keeping costs down for cities and towns um, because truly elections are incredibly expensive. And we wanted to, to do something to just make this a little bit simpler and faster for people. One of my favorite parts um, about voting in 2020, though, was the creativity that we saw in returning ballots. So I have towns in my district that also have spring elections, have municipal spring elections. And we had towns that created drive-through drop boxes. So if you live in Hatfield and you wanted to drop off your ballot, there was a box and you could drive past and, and put it in the box. There were drop boxes put out in many communities. Um, of course, this also led to some a few issues with people putting their ballots in the wrong boxes. Um, but it, I think in the end, we saw people participating more because of the ability to do those drop boxes. And that is in part because of one of the biggest debates is mail-in voting in Massachusetts. And that was whether mail-in voting should be, you get an application, to vote, to request a ballot rather, or you just get a ballot. So as we were debating this legislation, we had maybe five or six different bills that were presented and they all looked at this in a slightly different way. For applications, the arguments are only people who want to vote get them. It avoids sending ballots to um, the homes of people who have moved because those voter rolls are never fully accurate. There's also, um, and I do not believe that there is increased voter fraud with mail-in voting and all the statistics show that that, is tr that that is true, that there is not increased voter fraud. Voter fraud is actually extremely rare, um, but the applications helped ease concerns of people who said, what if there could be voter fraud? Um, and it really, um, it, there was an option of having applications where you could apply for both your primary ballot and your general ballot if you wanted. Um, it increased postage costs though, so it was slightly more expensive. But in the end, um, because this was a new system for Massachusetts, that's what we went with. We went with mailing the applications. I think um, we can all acknowledge that that was um, perhaps not done in as timely as a manner as we would have liked. I know I got a lot of calls um, from constituents who were really worried because they had sent in their application and they hadn't received their ballot and time was getting short. Um, for the primary election, we had the option of dropping your ballot off in that ballot box. And then if you didn't get it, you could go in on election day and vote in person if you wanted. But your ballot just had to be in either through the drop box or by mail, or you could go in and vote by person by 8 p.m. on election day. And that was the compromise for the primary election. For the general election, it's gonna be different. But I think it's really important to note this, this sentence at the bottom, that even with all of these issues and concerns about ballot delivery and getting your ballot into the drop box as opposed to mailing it back. Massachusetts had the highest voter turnout we have had in decades in this primary election. Um, every campaign that was running a candidate in this election was shocked at the number of people who turned out. No one was ready for that level of participation. And that is wonderful and exciting. And it means that we hit upon something that was good and that we need to continue to do. So what comes next? Well, like I said, mail-in voting was only for 2020. And again, our constitution 
does not allow for us to have mail-in voting unless we fix the Constitution. So we're going to need a constitutional amendment in Massachusetts. The other news is that the bill that we passed only focuses on 2020. So in the hopefully um, unlikely or, or hopefully we will not have to deal with COVID come the next election cycle because we will have municipal elections next year. But if we do, it will take another piece of legislation to allow for mail-in voting or as the permanent fix, the constitutional amendment. And as far as I'm concerned, that is the next thing that we have to take care of as a state. And unfortunately, it does not just happen quickly. Um, election day voter registration. Election day voter registration fixes the problem of inaccuracies at the polls. So if you go in and your the address that you live at is not exactly what it says in the book, while you may be able to cast a provisional ballot, it is not always the case. And it should be something just, it should be much faster to take care of. This year in the legislation, because we also included funding as a component, we spent money on electronic poll books. Electronic poll books make it easier to register people to vote right there at the polls. And so hopefully we were greasing the wheels to get to election day voter registration. The next thing that I think we're going to need to focus on is allowing people who will be 18 at the time of the general election to vote in the primary. Again, this is something that they do in other states. Um, I know that there are very, very active young people in Northampton and beyond in Western Massachusetts, because I feel like Western Massachusetts is the hotbed of all things related to voter access, but they are passionate about this, as well as lowering the age for municipal voting. I'm focusing on the state level today, but um, I think that this is going to be key because when you have races, like for example, the, the Senate race between Senator Markey and Congressman Kennedy, and you are not allowed to vote in that primary, but you get to vote in the general, really, you are not getting to have your say. And, and this is for people really whose birthdays fall between primary and general. And then funding. Um, we were able to get some money through the CARES Act for funding elections because of the acknowledgement that this was going to cost more during COVID, but we're going to have to keep fighting for that funding. Um, unfortunately, a lot of times we order that there will be early voting, we pass legislation to allow for early voting, extra voter precautions, all of those things, and we don't fund it. They are unfunded mandates on our cities and towns. And then I won't talk too much about this because I believe we will hear a lot more about it coming up in the presentation, but enfranchising those who are incarcerated. You heard me talk earlier about how you are not allowed to vote if you have been incarcerated for voter fraud or for a felony, but that leaves a lot of room and there's a lot of activity around this topic topic, um, including in Massachusetts. So what are the barriers to getting this done at all? Well, the first one is always the same. It's political will. And unfortunately, the people who make decisions about what our election should look like are elected officials who have a lot of skin in the game. So we need a Secretary of State who's really supportive. Um, we need a Secretary of State who wants to make sure that everybody can access voting and who does things like get ballot applications out on time, for example. Um, so that's number one. So making sure that there's pressure put on the Secretary of State to do his or her job and to be as proactive as possible is really important. Also need to make sure that that person is putting pressure on the federal government and uniting with other secretaries of state to really let them know what our states need to run successful elections. I think one thing that's really confusing to people is we do not have federal elections. States run elections for federal offices. So the secretary of state is truly crucial. And then we need um, to convince politicians who make decisions based on concerns about their own re-elections. Um, I have found it to be incredibly frustrating when we make decisions about election day, for example, being September 1st. Um, that decision was made because, of course, we don't want to have elections at the same time as one of the Jewish holidays, and there are a lot of Jewish holidays in September. Um, but that means we get to be creative. We get to maybe make election day not on a Tuesday, but on a Thursday, because election day should not coincide with the largest move-in day for 
colleges and universities in Massachusetts if we actually care about young people voting. Um, it should not be on the first of a month because we know that people move. There are lots of things that should be going into these decisions rather than simply looking at the calendar, avoiding the holidays as appropriate, but um, not necessarily taking into account what people's lives look like. Um, I will say it over and over, funding, so pressure on the legislature to actually fund uh, elections and pressure on the federal government to back that up. Um, poll workers. So every year, our cities and towns look for people to work at the polls. It is a paid job, but it's not a volunteer job. And safe in-person elections cannot happen with, without poll workers. Um, and it was really challenging this year. A lot of times um, our poll workers tend to be older people who rightfully maybe not, don't want to go out in person because of COVID um, and come into situations where they're encountering lots of other people, but Convincing people, friends, family, anyone who feels safe to be a poll worker is critical to making sure our elections are safe moving forward. And then I think the, the biggest obstacle that we face to safe elections really, or to, to, or to expanding voter access really is fear of change. Um, and it's, it, it's um, not a logical fear, really. I mean, we've seen mail-in voting happen across the country. Washington State is a great example. They use mail-in voting regularly. It works really well. They have higher rates of participation in elections. So we don't need to worry about voter fraud because we've seen it happen. We don't need to worry about allowing someone who's turning 18 on September 5th to participate in an election on September 1st because we've seen it happen in 25 states. And it works works. Um, but there is, there's consistent fear about this. And so um, working and talking to each other about what elections can look like and how elections can be safe is also an important way to actually have change occur. And finally, um, I just put forth a lot of important reminders um, about this upcoming election um, in 2020. So remember that election day is actually November 3rd. The last day to register online is the 24th. The last day to register by mail is a, has to be sent in postmarked by the 24th. And this is different from the primary. On the primary, things had to be received by, but for the general election, we're allowing postmarked by, which is a big difference. Um, early voting period runs from October 17th to Friday, October 30th. And I want you to note, because I think this is important when we talk about fear of change, that overlap means that we have voting and registration at the exact same time. So we can do election day voter registration because we're already doing it. Um, and then my last final plug before we move on to our other wonderful speakers is if you really care about elections and you really care about voting, make sure you fill out your census. And I know that doesn't seem like it's connected, but it is because your census determines how we divide up representation across both the state and federal level. So whether the number of people we have in Congress, who is going to be your state representative or your state senator, where those lines are, if your whole town gets one representative or if you get divided up amongst different representatives, that's all based on the numbers and having a complete count is the best way to make sure that you're fully represented. So thank you very much for uh, allowing me to speak here tonight and remember to vote. Well, thank you so much, Lindsay. That was really informative. And thank you for the great work you're doing at the State mm -hmm. House. Um, I know uh, many of my, uh, I have many friends still in that area and uh, they sing your praises. So um, our next speaker is also somebody who's been quite active uh, for some time. Lois Arends has been an activist and organizer for social justice for more than 50 years. She is the founding director of the Real Cost of Prisons Project, a national organization based in Northampton, which uh, began in 2000. Among the accomplishments of the project are three comic books, First, Prison Town, Paying the Price. Second, Prisoners of a Hard Life, Women and Their Children. And finally, Prisoners of, of the War on Drugs. More than 135,000 free comics were sent to people who are incarcerated, 
their families, and organizers throughout the country. The comic books are anthologized in The Real Cost of Prison Comics from PM Press, and The Real Cost of Prison's website includes writing from prison and comics from inside, a platform for hundreds of brilliant incarcerated writers and cartoonists to connect their ideas and analysis with the so-called free world. For years of correspondence and visits with people who are incarcerated have led her to focus on extreme sentences and the punitive and damaging conditions of confinement she has led faced by every person incarcerated in the US. In Massachusetts, she has led campaigns to stop new jail and prison building, ending the videotaping of, by guards of women being strip searched, organized to end bail money, and creating alternatives to incarceration. You can find more about the project uh, by going to their website, www.realcostofprisons.org, or find them on Facebook. Lois will be speaking to us uh, tonight about the disenfranchisement of people, most especially black people, with criminal convictions as a continuation of Jim Crow and the undermining of the victories of voting rights from the 1960s and the disenfranchisement of people in Massachusetts in particular. Welcome, Lois. Thank you. And uh, thank you for inviting me and for including um, this topic in the panel tonight. Uh, in the early 1970s, there were approximately 200,000 people incarcerated in prisons and jails in the United States. Today, there are more than 2.3 million people. This is a result of the war on drugs, the increased power of prosecutors to extract plea bargains and extreme sentences such as life without the possibility of parole. It is a system built on individual and systemic racism. Black people make up the majority of people incarcerated and criminalized, resulting in their disenfranchisement. Being incarcerated, having a criminal record, being on probation or parole can mean disenfranchisement. According to the Sentencing Project, the number of people disenfranchised has gone from an estimated 1 million people in 1976 to 6 million people today. While laws prohibiting, the, uh, from prohibiting people from voting who are incarcerated and with criminal convictions, began in the early 1900s at the same time as the monuments to the Confederacy were being built. These laws drastically impacted black people and communities of color as the country moved from incarceration to what we have now, mass incarceration. Researchers at the Brennan Center for Justice reported last week that, quote, Conviction and imprisonment affect more people in more serious ways than was previously realized. Using data through 2017, the report concludes that about 7.7 .7 million living Americans have at some point been imprisoned, and about 12.1 million have been convicted of a felony without being imprisoned for it, and 45 million people have been convicted of at least one misdemeanor, end quote. Disenfranchisement intends to and does roll back many of the gains of the Civil Rights Movement and the Voting Rights Act. <clears throat> According to the Sentencing Project, over 7.4% of the adult African-American population is disenfranchised compared to 1.8% of the non-African-American population. There are now thousands of studies and hundreds of books about what drives the disproportionate incarceration and criminalization of Black people. Since the death of Tamir Rice and Michael Brown in 2014, and then Sandra Bland, Philando Castillo, and George Floyd, and so many others, we've become more aware of the racial bias in policing. Each were killed by police when they were racially profiled through stop and frisk, driving, and even walking while black. 
there are literally millions of other instances which thankfully do not result in death, but do result in charges, plea bargains, and a criminal record leading to, among many other intended consequences, voter disenfranchisement. For example, there are 13 million people with misdemeanors a year, 80% of all arrests. According to Alexandra Natapoff, white people facing misdemeanor charges are nearly 75% more, more likely than black people to have all their charges carrying potential imprisonment dropped, dismissed, or reduced to lesser charges. For black people, misdemeanors can result in jail time, along with fines and fees and the restrictive practices of probation. Also driving mass incarceration is the war on drugs, which has come to mean a war of extreme policing and surveillance on black and brown communities. Like misdemeanors, racial disparities for people criminalized for drug crimes are stark. Black people are nearly four times as likely as white people to be arrested for drug offenses and two and a half more times likely to be arrested just for drug possession. Since the beginning of the war on drugs in the early 1980s, the number of people incarcerated for drug offenses has gone from 41,000 in 1980 to 469,000 in 2015. Today, there are more people behind bars for a drug offense than the number of people who were imprisoned for any crime in 1980. African-American drug users constitute 35% of drug arrests, 55% of convictions, and 74% of the people sentenced to position, prison for drug possession. Every arrest, every stop, every incarceration for even a day or a week destabilizes individuals, their families, and their communities. Driving mass incarceration also is the power of district attorneys. Prosecutors have become judge and jury. The increased power of district attorneys results in a huge increase in plea bargains and the, incarcer and the incarceration of people who fear going to trial and so accept a plea bargain. More than 95% of cases are plea bargained. 95% of elected prosecutors are white and 85% of prosecutors run unopposed. In 48 states, voting from prison, which is legal in most of the European Union and in South Africa and Canada and Kenya and many other countries is severely restricted or outlawed altogether. Only Maine and Vermont allow prisoners with felony convictions to vote. In the last few years, campaigns to restore voting rights have succeeded in several states. The legislatures of Kentucky, New Jersey, and Louisiana have restored voting rights for large numbers of formerly incarcerated people. Recently, the governor of Iowa restored the vote for people with felony convictions. However, in Iowa and in many states, people who are on probation and parole cannot vote. According to the Prison Policy Initiative, there, this is an estimated 4.5 million, there is an estimated uh, 4.5 million adults under community supervision, that is parole and probation. Therefore, while the vote has been restored for some formerly incarcerated people, many, many more still cannot vote. As you may have read, since 2018, there have been campaigns to restore voting rights to people with felony convictions in Florida. A voting rights amendment to the Florida Constitution, Constitution passed with 64% voting in favor of restoring voting to Florida's citizens. 
since then, Governor DeSantis and the Republican legislation, fearing the enfranchisement of more than a million voters, most of them black, have done all that they can do to stop the for formerly incarcerated people from voting. Re Republican state legislators passed a law requiring potential voters to pay court imposed fines and fees before they could cast a ballot. For many people, the state has been unable to even calculate the amount of money owed, and many other people cannot pay the fees, which are in the hundreds and sometimes thousands of dollars. Advocates say this is the equivalent of a new poll tax. With, so, with several court cases, the most recent one favoring the governor just a few days ago, it is uncertain if more than a million people, the majority of them black and brown people, will be able to vote in November. <clears throat> and now for a look at Massachusetts. According to 2016 data, the Massachusetts Sentencing Commission, uh, from the Massachusetts Sentencing Commission, 655 of every 100,000 black people are in prison in Massachusetts. Meanwhile, the state locks up 82 of its white citizens for every 100,000 people. After this report was issued, Ralph Gantz, Chief Justice of the Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court, who very, very sadly passed away last Monday at the age of 65, asked Harvard Law School's criminal justice policy program to see if they could find out why. They did not find that black people commit much more crime or commit worse crimes. They found that despite making up only 24% of Boston's population, black people made up 63% of people who were interrogated, stopped, frisked, or searched by the Boston Police Department. Unfortunately, there was no statistics on Springfield and Holyoke. Also, that average bail is higher in cases involving Black defendants. Furthermore, Black and Latinx defendants are detained without bail as compared to white defendants, meaning they are much more likely to accept a plea bargain. The researchers found that prosecutors are also more likely to exercise their discretion to send Black and Latinx people to superior court where the available sentences are longer. And if you're Black and charged with crimes carrying a mandatory minimum, you are substantially more likely to be incarcerated and receive a longer sentence. The researchers found that they, quote, could not conclusively isolate the impact of unconscious bias, prejudice, and racism in generating the disparities precisely because there was so much of it, end quote. One result is, is that in Massachusetts, that translates into an unequal, unequal loss of political power. 6% of the state's adult population is Black but that compares to 27% of those disenfranchised as of 2016. Latinx people constitute 10% of our adult population, but 24% of our incarcerated population. In Massachusetts, if you are incarcerated for a felony, you cannot vote. Until 2000, people incarcerated in Massachusetts could vote. Then a group of prisoners at Norfolk Prison had the audacity to try to form a political action committee. Acting Governor Paul Cellucci was so outraged by this that he introduced a constitutional amendment in the legislature to disenfranchise prisoners. It passed the legislature twice and then voters approved it by more than 60%. The Prison Policy Initiative observed that it was, quote, the first time that the Massachusetts Constitution has been amended to take away rights 
from a group of people, end quote. In 2019, Senator Adam Hines introduced an amendment that would restore the vote to prisoners convicted of felonies. It did not get out of committee. However, the tide may be turning. In the primary between Ed Markey and Joe Kennedy, both agreed that all US citizens should be able to vote. Congresswoman Ayanna Presley filed a congressional resolution that called for the same. And our Congressman Jim, Jim McGovern agrees. In the race between Richard Neal and Alex Morse, Morse supported voting rights for incarcerated people. And of course, Bernie Sanders coming from Vermont where prisoners could always vote, brought the issue into the presidential primary. Unfortunately though, neither Biden nor Harris support enfranchising prisoners. Currently, I am a member of a statewide coalition which includes Common Cause, the League of Voters, Decarcerate Western Mass, and many others. We're working to ensure that people held pretrial or are convicted of misdemeanors or are civilly committed and who are allowed to vote have access to the ballot. Representative Sabadosa, along with Senator Hines, has just drafted a letter to the president of the Massachusetts Sheriff's Association, asking him to inform and encourage sheriffs to make ballot access available. We are encouraging uh, Secretary of the Commonwealth, uh, William Galvin, to issue clear guidance and guidelines about the law to city and town clerks. Clerks need to hear guidelines from Galvin. Here in Northampton, we are working with jail st staff, and most especially city clerk Pamela Powers, so that people can request an absentee ballot and vote by mail. According to a Massachusetts statute, incarcerated people do not have to be registered to request a ballot and that they are specially qualified in the same way as people voting abroad. It is my hope in the next legislative session, a new bill will be introduced to enfranchise the more than 14,000 incarcerated people in Massachusetts, most of them Black and Latinx, and unlike in 2019, it will have a hearing and a vote in both houses, and we will have a conversation about who Massachusetts disenfranchises. In the meantime, I'm glad to be working to ensure that everyone who is incarcerated in jails and who is eligible to vote and wants to vote will have access to the ballot and vote in November. Thank you. Well, thank you, Lois, um, for your remarks and for the incredible work that you've done for so many of the years and continue to do. Uh, it's really um, beyond impressive and so necessary. And I have a question for you when we get to the question and answer part, but we'll wait on that. Okay. Um, let me introduce our, our final speaker tonight, uh, David Daly. He is the author of the national bestseller, and I'll give you the um, uh, GP uh, version of the, the title, Rat Eft, Why Your Vote Doesn't Count, uh, which the New York Times has called the definitive book on revealing the history and implications of partisan gerrymandering. His new book, Unrigged, How Americans Are Battling Back to Save Democracy, chronicles the national citizen-led fight to win voting rights and electoral reform. His work has been published in The New Yorker, The New York Times, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, and many other uh, publications. He is himself the former editor-in-chief of Salon, has taught politics and journalism at Boston College and Wesleyan, and is a senior fellow at Fair Vote. David lives with his family in Haydenville. Tonight, David will talk to us about the process of gerrymandering, um, as well as his most recent book, Unrigged. Welcome, David. 
Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here. Um, so thank you to Dr. Nutter, to Lois, Representative Sabadosa. Um, following both of you is um, an honor and very difficult. Um, I think what Dr. Nutter laid out at the beginning is absolutely right, that we believe that there is this arc toward voting rights that has been increasingly progressive. Um, and yet, um, as she and others have laid out tonight, at every step forward, there has been a backlash, there's been retrenchment. It's never as simple as Dr. King's arc toward a moral justice. It's about all of us pulling that arc in the direction that we wanted to go. Um, we could all, I think, use a little bit of hope. These have been some difficult um, and dark and dark days, I think, probably since Friday evening, uh, we have all felt the need for a little bit of uplift. So let me try and round out um, these talks with a sense of what is happening on the fight back for voting rights. Um, the book that I just published, Unrigged, really began with exactly that quest for hope. Um, I had written um, a book with that indeed memorable title of of Rat Eft, which uh, first exposed the highly effective Republican strategy called the Red Map, which is short for the Redistricting Majority Project, which was their 2010 effort to win back state legislatures in competitive states of Ohio, North Carolina, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Florida, just ahead of the decennial redistricting, the census that Representative Sabados that was talking about, um, and then use powerful new map making software and data sets to redraw not only our state legislative and congressional districts, but really to hotwire our democracy itself. I mean, let me assure you, nobody sets out to write a book about partisan gerrymandering, but Red Map was something that came as news to me. I was the editor of Salon at the time. I was editing Steve Kornacki and Joan Walsh, but gerrymandering, we didn't talk about it in this way. Uh, but every day we were covering the madness that was unfolding in the U.S. House, the body that John Adams designed, right, to be the perfect uh, replica of the people in miniature. That people's house instead voted to repeal Obamacare more than 50 times, each one of them a show vote with no chance of actually passing. Um, then as a, a Connecticut native with a newborn child, I watched kindergartners and first graders massacred at Sandy Hook and thought, surely, despite the political power of the gun lobby, the senseless slaughter of six and seven-year-olds must lead to some action on guns so this doesn't happen to any American family ever again. And we all know what happened. Um, and so I asked one simple question. I said, why didn't Democrats take back the House in 2012 when President Obama won re-election and they took back the Senate? It turns out the Democrats won 1.4 million more votes in 2012, but Republicans kept a 234-201 majority. So those Obamacare votes, the refusal to act after Sandy Hook, the vitriol in our politics, none of it was a mistake. It's what Red Map had created. And now we live in this Red Map nation, uh, an anti-majoritarian nation that gerrymandering helped build. Um, it's one of the most important reasons I think our politics has become so extreme, so dysfunctional. Um, one of the reasons in part why Americans are in the streets demanding social justice during a pandemic, because we know that voting in such a broken system is at once essential and yet no longer enough. There are now 59 million Americans, that is just about one in five of us, who live in a state in which one or both chambers of the state legislature is controlled by the party that won fewer votes in the 2018 election. So I would give some talks about this book and I would often feel like I had the dark rain cloud hanging over my head. I was pig pen in the Peanuts comics. Um, you can understand why I needed some optimism. Um, I saw a Facebook post by a young woman in Michigan named Katie Fahey. And uh, Katie has an amazing story on election night 2016. She's 27 years old. She leaves her job at a Grand Rapids a recycling company. She puts on her best red pantsuit. She flies to New York. She's got a golden ticket for Hillary Clinton's victory party in New York City. That night did not go as Katie planned. Um, she's back in Grand Rapids um, for, for her work on Thursday morning. She's already looking ahead, terrified of the family battles that are going to happen uh, over Thanksgiving. There's going to be mashed potatoes and gravy and cranberry sauce flying through the air, right? And she goes to Facebook and she writes, I'd like to take on gerrymandering in Michigan. 
if you're interested in doing this as well, let me know. And she maybe she connects it because she added a smiley face emoji at the end of it. Uh, or maybe it's because gerrymandering in Michigan had completely severed the connection between the people and the ballot box. Um, but that simple post by a regular citizen, by a 27 year old, it pioneers a winning redistricting revolution in a state where no one thought it could happen that marshaled thousands of volunteers, collected more than 400,000 signatures for a state constitutional amendment, and they won in November of 2018 with more than 62% of the vote. It wasn't long after that that I spoke at an event with Desmond Mead, who was Lois talked about had taken on the difficult task of returning voting rights to almost 1.7 million people in Florida who had essentially lost their civic voice forever along with a felony conviction, even after they'd served their time. It's a cruel vestige of the Jim Crow South that ensnared 10% of adults in the state, 25% of African Americans. And Desmond has got this inner glow and he knew the pain of this because he was one of those silent citizens Drug addiction, a deep depression, led to a felony weapons charge. One afternoon after his release, homeless, still struggling with drugs, he stands before the railroad tracks outside Miami and he thinks he's going to jump in front of the next oncoming train. And the train just doesn't come. So he walks across those tracks it's as if he's guided by some kind of higher power, he told me, and he finds himself outside a drug treatment center. He gets himself cleaned up. He gets his life in order. He goes back to school, he gets a law degree, right? But the one thing in Florida he can never get back is the one thing he wants. He wants his right to vote. So he becomes the director of the Florida Rights Restoration Commission. He builds an amazing coalition in 2018. It unites black and white Democrats and Republicans uh, former convicts and second chance believing churchgoers, tattooed Trump loving deplorables and radical criminal justice reformers into this mighty moral movement. And they win on election day 2018. Even as Florida elects a Republican governor and a Republican US Senator, they win 64% of the vote on a constitutional amendment that restored their voting rights. The people of Florida voted for fairness. I was pretty certain that we didn't need another book about how democracy dies. There's plenty of those in the library shelves. I set out to join these quiet revolutionaries who were trying to reinvigorate our civic fabric at the moment it seemed to me we absolutely needed it most. And I got to watch as these regular citizens demolished barriers that all the experts said were too high, too stout, too imposing, it couldn't be done. I joined the canvassers in Michigan. We door knocked across Utah and Missouri as activists won these important redistricting reforms in red states. I watched Native Americans across the Red Rock desert of Utah and the tribal lands of North Dakota mount these desperate heroic pushes to determine their street addresses and make themselves tribal IDs to preserve their voices against surgically focused voter ID bills and intricate precinct closures. I got to ride the Medicaid Express, a rickety green RV across Idaho with these gutsy millennial activists who didn't understand why their state legislature wouldn't take their tax dollars back from the government and expand Medicaid for 70,000 of their neighbors so they could have health care. They wouldn't take no for an answer. In Alabama, where the state legislature under court order finally returned voting rights denied to tens of thousands of citizens who'd been released from prison, but refused to allocate even a dime to actually go and register them. Citizens set out, and I got to go with them from bus station to barbershop with folks who were determined to add their neighbors back to the voting rolls. They won, they won big, and they won everywhere. It, to me, is proof that our hard work, that our collective fight can make things better. Those citizens became the change they wanted to see. At a time when the news cycle feeds like this never ending sense of despair, we're all doom scrolling through Twitter. It was inspiring to get to ride alongside those who turned off MSNBC, even our friend Rachel up the road, they logged off of Twitter, they got to work. These folks in Idaho, the Medicaid expansion initiative there began after two recent graduates from a high school in the northernmost notch of the state. Now they were studying medicine, they were studying history. They realized they had organizing skills that might help pass a school levy in their hometown. They won, that victory made them hungry for more. They took on health care as an issue. They painted that 40 year old RV and they crusaded to every corner of the state collecting signatures in this one party state that right, it's, it's redder than Taylor Swift's lipstick in Idaho. They won 61% of the vote the old fashioned way. 
They went door to door and they persuaded their neighbors that this was the right thing to do. Got to watch in North Dakota, again, another powerful story. It's a state with such clean elections that they don't even require voter registration there. Everybody at the precinct has known you since kindergarten. But in 2013, perhaps not coincidentally, after the Native American vote narrowly catapulted Democrat Heidi Heitkamp into the US Senate, legislators there decided to pass a voter ID bill that mandated, guess what, a street address, the one thing they knew didn't exist on tribal land. The tribe spent years and they knocked it back in court. The legislature kept trying, refining it more and more. And finally, just before election day in 2018, they got a judge who okayed it. And so those tribes got to work. You had folks working out the geo-mapping coordinates of, of every home on these hundreds and hundreds of miles of land, volunteers buying machines. They created so many new IDs that they burned these machines out. The law had directly threatened the vote of these Native Americans. On election day, they turned out in massive numbers to protect it. Turnout surges. The legislator who wrote that original voter ID bill back in 2013, he not only loses, he loses to a woman named Ruth Buffalo, who becomes the first Native American Democrat elected to the North Dakota State House. So these efforts, they're not led by politicians, they're not led by parties, they began with regular people. You've got the political media, right? They want to go camp out outside a diner in the middle of Michigan and give you a sort of, you know, white male heartland, blue plate wisdom. Someplace else, this new national activism emerges. Citizens asking how they could contribute and they found answers in their hometowns, in their states. Wasn't easy, wasn't ever easy. The forces lined up against reform, don't quit. Lois told you about the news from Florida. Uh, about how the legislature and the courts have worked to add a poll tax on top of this wonderful restoration of voting rights. We see the headlines every day as the president manufactures lies about mail-in voting, deceitful tweets that are themselves a form of voter suppression and an effort to sow doubts about the legitimacy of this fall's election. We see it every day. We see it in the post office. We see it as Tennessee makes it harder to vote during a pandemic when Oklahoma requires a notary for an absentee ballot, when Texas refuses to accept a pandemic as an excuse for absentee, when Wisconsin voters are forced to the polls for a primary to choose between their health and their right to vote. Frederick Douglass said it best, right? Power concedes nothing without a demand. It never has and it never will. The history of voting rights, it's one of expansion and one of retraction. It's not a straight line forward. We've got to think about our current fight as the latest chapter in a struggle over the vote that's really as long and old as our nation itself. The struggle did not end with the passage of the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments, or with the 19th Amendment, or with the Voting Rights Act, or with any of these reforms on Election Day 2018. There's a lot of work to do. These struggles are as old as America. These struggles go on. Our frayed democracy, more fragile than we imagined, it's not going to be healed with any single election or victory. The progress we need is not going to be measured by any individual politician winning election, but by the number of battles and people who are engaged. Keeping a democracy requires a lot of work, and it's all of our work. I think my favorite story in this book comes from Alabama, and I want to tell it quickly. Um, about a night that a woman named Sherry lost her voting rights forever. And it began like any other teenage evening in late 90s rural Alabama. Some high school friends piled in a classmate's ride, a drive through run, dinner on the hood of a car. Someone passed around marijuana, the sound of a police car, two white officers wondering what that odor might be. I think Lois told you really well what happens um, and the difference when this happens to, in a white, in a white town and in a black town. Um, plenty of cops in those white towns might have looked the other way, let the kids off with a warning. Tony or suburbs, no doubt, this exact same event ended differently. But for Sherry, that evening ended with drug possession charges. In the eyes of the state, they were no longer just high school seniors, they were felons. And in Alabama, felons guilty of a crime involving moral turpitude, as this minor possession charge was, an offense so small it wouldn't even be charged in some states, in some towns. They forfeited their right to vote forever. She was 17 and she'd never voted. 
and now she never would. Her most important right as a citizen was gone forever before she even exercised it. I had no idea, she told me. We weren't thinking about voting. But it's these laws from the Jim Crow era, and they're hardly consigned to history. They ensnared her 150 years later. Um, Alabama's legislature finally ends moral turpitude for all but the most serious crimes, uh, treason, murder, in, in 2017. But the state was determined to keep that news completely quiet. They wouldn't even update the forms, let alone notify people that they had their voting rights back. So citizens started going door to door, bus stop to bus stop in search of these people. It's how I met Sherry. It's how I heard her story outside the bus station in Birmingham. Just before 6 a.m. one summer morning, she was waiting for a ride to the hair salon where she works. We approached, asked if she was registered to vote. She kind of pushed us away. You know, nobody is interested in, you know, telling a, an old white guy like me that they've got a felony conviction as they're, as they're on their way to work in the morning. Um, so we simply tell them we're out informing people about a change in the law, that a felony conviction in your no longer cost people a permanent right to vote and her eyes kind of get wide. We show her the clipboard with the list of crimes and say, if it's not one of these, you know, if it's, if it's not treason, we can sign you up to vote right now. And it took us two minutes to hand her back her voting rights. And by the end of this, we were all in tears. And she says, I will be a lifelong voter. And that to me, that to me, that story is, is really what this is about. Um, we're fighting for Sherry. Um, this is a nation that has been built by people, it's been improved by people, whether it's the women who marched for suffrage or the marchers who walked across Selma's Pettus Bridge. Our progress has been long, it's been hard, but it's been of our own making. Days before John Lewis's death in July of 2020, he asked to visit the new Black Lives Matter Plaza in Washington. He was frail, he was with a cane, he was wearing a 1619 cap. He took in the scene from a nearby rooftop walk the street below. He rejoiced in those giant yellow letters. And in a really powerful essay published posthumously in the New York Times, he wrote about that final trip to DC, how inspired he was to see the power of citizens once more, these young people demanding their voice, running for office, courageously speaking truth to power. And he wrote in that piece, democracy is not a state, it is an act. Ordinary people with extraordinary vision can redeem the soul of America by getting in what I call good trouble, necessary trouble. Voting and participating in the democratic process are key. The vote is the most powerful nonviolent change agent you have in a democratic society. You must use it because it is not guaranteed. You can lose it. So this is our work. This is our task. Understanding democracy is an action, a verb, something that must be tended, something within ourselves that we must work to protect every day. That's the work that built this nation at its best. And it's what we must do once more to renew our determination that we reach those ideals for everybody. The life of John Lewis shows this capacity for perseverance and tremendous courage lies within us all. But the struggles that are ongoing still at his death show that we have a long, long way to go. Yet I think something has been lit um, within the American people. You've got citizens who've never before joined a protest, taking to the streets, circulating petitions, stepping forward to run for office, launching new organizations, or joining movements that reimagine what democracy might mean. They dreamed a different future. They ignored those who said the work would be too hard, scorned their efforts as irrelevant, or warned that the odds of victory seemed far too uncertain for such a heavy lift. And then they devoted long hours and they came together by the thousands in RVs and courtrooms and bus stations at the doors on frigid winter mornings. And they made those dreams real at the ballot box. They won resounding majorities of their citizens. They inspired Americans in red states, in blue states, in every state, who still believe that all political power is inherent in the people, that all legitimate authority depends on the consent of the governed, that representative democracy must represent us all equally. We know that the threats to democracy are real. We don't know whether the usual peaceful transfer of power that we've so blithely assumed will occur should the president lose this next election. But this year has laid bare the present anti-majoritarianism of our system, the inequalities of the electoral college, the rural biases of the US Senate. It has showed us how fragile our institutions, the census, the postal service, the media, the justice system can be.
and how unprepared we are for the unimaginable when it happens here. But I hope that the lesson of Katie Fahey and Desmond Mead and the Marchers for Social Justice and every single one of these volunteers is that we do not need superheroes or the perfect presidential candidate to save us, that these battles on behalf of what is right, that they have been led by millennials, uh, by people who have been released from, from, from prison, by suburban women, by Americans of all ages, of all races, who refuse to believe that creating change was something that was beyond them. To me, it's the proof that there is a reckoning and unrigging that's underway. And I hope that the story leaves you with the same sense of optimism and hope that it did for me getting to ride along with all of these amazing people. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dave. That's a compelling um, sort of encapsulation of what's happening right at this very moment. And I want to get back to that. Um, I haven't really seen any direct questions in the chat yet from other folks. So um, I, as always have some questions because I always, you know, when exchanges like this, I'm always, um, but what about this? Um, so I have um, for, for each of you, and then um, I'd like to, if we get some questions from other folks who've uh, been listening in and watching, um, I uh, will certainly include those, but I have one for each of you and then, um, ending uh, with a, a group question. Uh, for, for Lois, um, I wanted to um, ask you, I mean, historically, what has been the rationale for not allowing um, prisoners, much less those on parole or probation even, uh, to vote? What um, the rationale is that They've given, you know, that by committing a crime, they've forfeited their right to citizenship. Mm -hmm. And they're, you know, they're, that that's the reason, that's the reason. And um, I mean, there are, I mean, voting is one of many things that people who have felony convictions do forfeit, I mean, their rights to voting being one of them. So, I mean, that's, that's, that's the, the reason. And that was the, the first group of bills or legislation that came out in the South. I, some of the original ones in Florida back in the 1880s or 1870s, I can't remember exactly, was it exactly that. that. That was part of that Mississippi plan um, and was, you know, particularly, but it's become, you know, it's obviously, um, you know, there's issues in other states. Um, uh, as we heard, Vermont and Maine, um, this you know, are the only states that allow prisoners uh, to vote while in, in while incarcerated. Right. So there's 48 other states, many of whom are not in the South. Might no, I, I mean I don't say I don't think it's. I mean I don't want to like demonize the South here. It started in the South, right. and and other states. I mean Iowa was one of the Iowa was one of the last states to restore um, voting rights for, just for people that have been previously incarcerated. So, mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, and here's an example of Massachusetts who in the year 2000 took away the voting rights of prisoners, you know? So, I mean, it's not, it's not a regional thing. It's not a Southern thing. It's not a Western thing. It's a U.S. thing. Mm -hmm. And it's a U.S. thing uh, that is based on stigmatizing, hating, all of the words that, you know, go along with somebody with a criminal conviction. Mm -hmm. You know, the reason that you can't get a student loan, the reason that you can't live where you want to live, the, you know, on, I mean, all kinds of things that. Not just voting. Keep, not just voting. I mean, you know, when I said, you know, one of many intended consequences disenfranchisement is just one of those intended consequences. But there are literally thousands, literally thousands of prohibitions for formerly incarcerated people, including not being able to vote. And then, I mean, there are these two categories. There are people who are incarcerated who can't vote. And then there are millions of other people 
who are on probation or parole or have a felony conviction that can't vote. So it's, it's millions and millions of people that are disenfranchised. It just depends on where you want to look. If you want to look in every prison, yes, except in Maine and Vermont. But if you want to, if you want to look at the millions of people on probation, the millions of people with felony convictions, that's a lot of people. And the majority of those people are black and brown people. And so it's carrying out this Jim Crow legacy. And, and you know, I mean, that's what's so um, important for us to know about it and for important for us to work against it. Mm -hmm. um. Okay, I'm just checking no questions, so I'll move on. Um, Lindsay, I was wondering um, if you could say more about um, the work around perhaps lowering the required age for voting uh, in Massachusetts uh, and uh, what, you know, um, you know, the efforts and what, what are the arguments for and against, I guess, because we're actually still hopeful of a panel next month uh, with some of those um, high school activists. Um, it's fingers crossed. Uh, but I'd like to hear what you're, you know, from a, a state legislator's point of view, um, what are you hearing as the arguments for and against? Absolutely. Well, so I'm glad to hear that that panel may be happening because I was going to say that the best people to answer that question are really the ones who are on the ground and doing that work, who reach out to my office really regularly to ask for advice about how to move this forward. Um, so there is there, so there are a few things. Um, there's a movement to move forward with um, redu reducing the age to vote on a municipal level, and that can be done uh, statewide, and it can also be done city by city and town. And so those are done through home rule petitions. Um, a lot of times, those are bills that involve just one individual community. They're usually approved by a city council and the mayor and then they're sent to the legislator to move forward. Um, so just affects one town and they're usually a little bit easier to move except sometimes bills like this that are more controversial in nature. Um, there And then there's the Empower Act which would do this on a state level. So there's a two-pronged approach. Um, right now, a lot of the students who are doing this organizing work are working with voting rights groups, and their arguments are pretty clear that these elections affect them in very significant ways. Um, they are often paying taxes because they're working, um, and so they feel that they should have a say in how money is, how money is spent. Um, I, I wish that all my constituents would write and talk about how money is spent and, and advocate for, um, for their taxes to be used in ways that are most beneficial to our society. Um, and so, you know, those are, I think they're very strong arguments that they're making. They're saying that they are engaged. Um, they know that young people have lower rates of, of voting than, um, than some of their older peers. I think that my presentation also underlined that we also make it more difficult for younger people to vote. But their argument really is voting is a habit. And so once you become the quote unquote super voter, the person who votes in all, all of the elections, that's not something that you tend to give up very easily. It's just, it's regular. You know, there's an election and you go down and you vote. And so if we can establish those patterns at the age of 16, then we're much more likely to see people voting at the ages of 18, 19, 20, 21, and, and hopefully for the rest of their lives. And the arguments against are really um, questions of maturity. People say, oh, is a 16 year old really someone who I want making decisions about how money is being spent. So the, the exact opposite argument. Um, and are they really informed voters? And then um, I have heard the concern from people who say, well, will they be pressured by their parents? But I would also argue that even if you are in your 30s or 40s and you go home for Thanksgivings and holidays, uh, there is also pressure from parents at any age to vote in a particular way. And that, that flows in both directions. Um, and so, you know, I, I'm very proud of the work that they're doing. I don't know how quickly they will be successful, but I do think 
eventually they will be because they're building the coalitions that they need to see this type of work come to fruition um, and it's been really really fabulous to watch and there's it's hard to argue that they're not mature enough to vote when you see the level of organizing that they have put forth well, thank you. I, and I am, we are all hopeful, Forbes and myself, um, that we can get that panel together because it just seemed um, such a way to um, end this series on a, a really hopeful, um, you know, forward-looking note. Um, the voters of the next 60 years, 70, 80 years, however, if they can start now. Um, and that, for the last couple of minutes, that brings me back to you, Dave. And um, but if we have time, and the and um, Lois and Lindsay, you want to chime in too? You you left us on a very optimistic, hopeful note. I'm you know I've been so um, depressed um, personally, uh, especially since Friday. Um, what the future of this nation is. Uh, sometimes it's not a good thing to be a historian and, you know, kind of know what's happened before. Um, and then at the same time, I'm so confused. How could this possibly be happening? Um, but anyway, um, there is does seem a sense, um, especially since George Floyd's um, tragic death, uh, an acceleration of that. Uh, the Black Lives Matter movement has been around for a while, but it's, you know, it's really escalated again. And the involvement of young people has, seems to have really grown. What do you, I'll start with you, Damon, if other, anyone else wants to chime in, great. But did, what do you think has, has created this moment? Um, what, you know, in, you know, 25 words or less. No, I'm just kidding. I think that the anti-majoritarianism and the unfairness of the system has really been laid bare over the course of these last several years and that it has become apparent to everyone that what we are seeing on the voting rights front is an attempt by a political party to maintain power with a shrinking base that is older, whiter, more conservative, more rural than the entire nation itself. Um, and that they are willing to use, to twist and pervert the rules of the game and just to drop justices on, 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 on courts at all levels to enforce that and to, and to gerrymander in such ways that um, elections um, matter less and votes get diluted um, and 25 words or less and I'm, I'm, I'm probably above 300. I was just kidding. Uh, but I'll, I'll wrap up, you know, I, I'd say this, I think what we have seen is and if you want to look at this in just like a, a 12 or 14 year history in a hundred words or less, um, it, it wasn't that long ago that the Voting Rights Act was reauthorized almost unanimously by the United States Congress. So it was 2006, mm -hmm. 2008, uh, we elected our first black president. And I think one political party looked at the changing demographics of the nation and said, we have two options here we can either attempt to talk to all Americans or we can try to put barriers in front of the ballot box for those who are not likely to vote for us. They chose the latter approach. Um, in 2010, they had a, a redistricting effort that was very successful. They redrew the maps in 2011 with the highest technology and, and most surgical precision you could possibly do. And, and those legislatures pass voter ID bills and precinct closures and um, all kinds of measures. And then after the Shelby County decision in 2013, it turbocharged. Um, and here we are today in 2020 trying to run an election in the middle of a pandemic. Um, so we are more aware than ever of the barriers that are put between us and the ballot box. We're more aware than ever that those barriers often depend on where we live and the makeup of our state legislature. Um, and we are more aware than ever that this is going to have to be undone if it's undone at the state level. 2020 is a presidential election year. We're all thinking about the White House. We're thinking about the Senate. We're thinking about who appoints these justices to the Supreme Court. 
It is also a census year, so fill out your census forms. And what happens after the census is we begin the process of redistricting. And in 2021, these new maps are gonna be drawn by state legislatures in all of these states. And the next president, I mean, cross your fingers at least, we'll have another presidential election in 2024. Um, I think it's still pretty likely. Uh, but so. the, 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 the maps that are drawn in 2021 are going to define the state of play in our politics in all of these states for the next decade. So the state legislature is on the ballot in 2020. The next decade is on the ballot. Get out and vote. Thank you. Um, Lois or Lindsay, do you have anything to add? We're, we're actually at time, but you know, you're good. Okay. Um, Faith, should I turn it back to you for the final? Or Lois, did you want to say something? Well, I just wanted to say not so much about voting, but in terms of, uh, you know, the, the, the momentum of organizing and the feeling of organizing. I think that for young people, especially, and especially young by, led by black young people and young people of color, I think that they really can feel what is happening in a visceral way. And I mean, these signs that we see over and over again, what do they say? Enough is enough. You know? And I think that's what people are feeling. Enough is enough. Mm -hmm. And that people have to, you know, come out of their houses, even if it's uncomfortable to come out of their houses and, and, and start really speaking out and organizing. So I think it's happening in this really visceral, visceral way out of pain and also out of hope. It is hopeful. Yeah. Hope. Both. Yes, I agree. Lindsay, do you, if you, you don't have to add anything if you don't want to. <laughs> <laughs> I think that so much has been said already. I don't want to add too much, but I am going to reiterate what David said about filling out your census because you only have until September 30th and it is really, really, truly critical. Well, thank you. Thank you all. You, um, I mean, I'm really glad that we can end this on a, a you know, fairly hopeful note. Um, you know, when talking about barriers to voting, I can't, you know, that doesn't necessarily lead to happy times. Um, but um, this has been, and what I tried to emphasize at the beginning was that there was an, a, you know, a sort of an arc towards increasing voting rights and, and, and that, so it's possible, you know, over, and it was over several decades. And yes, then it seemingly, you know, got slammed down in 2013 in particular. Um, but it doesn't mean, um, you know, not only am I a historian, but I'm old enough to remember, you know, I remember when the voting, uh, when the voting age dropped to 18. Um, I was 16. So I was like, whoa, cool. <laughs> um, so, you know, good stuff does happen, um, but it does take a lot of effort. And um, all your work, the, the three of you really are part of what's making it possible. So thank you. So now I will turn it back to Faith to wrap us up. Thank you, Kathleen. First, I have to say hi to Lou, though. Hi, Lou. Okay. <laughs> thank you. All right, I'm done. Thank you to all the panelists. Thank you for every, to everyone who came. And um, we're gonna send you a link to the recording so you can share it um, together with a survey. And we will be in touch about the last program that Kathleen mentioned. We've been working with some high school students and um, just haven't pinned down a date yet. So we will pass that information along.